Hi, this is John Romano, and this is my lecture, 12th Century Renewal, in my course on medieval history. Now, when it comes to the 12th century in Western Europe, uh, people, of, historians often like to speak about the many cultural achievements uh, that uh, Europeans were able to uh, gain in this period. And while that's certainly true, it's fair to say that all of this cultural uh, advancement really is based upon the steadily rising population and the amount of food production. Uh, so before one can really understand uh, the uh, uh, the kind of culture that came out of this period, one must understand uh, why there's so many more people and um, and how are they getting their food to feed all these people. From the 11th century on, uh, we begin to see population growth again in Western Europe. In a significant way and uh, the the this is really predicated on this uh this augmented food production that is sometimes referred to as the agricultural revolution um, another uh another era that uh, uses this term and um the origins of uh this new uh agricultural plenty uh, were doing something that had absolutely nothing to do with human beings at all Right around the millennium, right around the year 1000, there was a very slight uptick in temperature in Western Europe. Uh, and um, this new mild climate, uh, this uh, the fact that things were uh, um, warmer for the most part uh, and uh, less damp, meant that uh, the conditions for farming just were simply naturally better. Uh, and uh, in fact, what we, we can actually observe this uh, by seeing all kinds of new settlements that begin to grow up around farming. Uh, and uh, Western Europeans in this period will begin to reclaim new lands. Uh, so, that, for instance, uh, cutting down forests, draining swamps, uh, all this backbreaking labor uh, that took place over the course of long years. Um, this does give you some idea of these sort of patchworks of uh, various fields in Western Europe. I show you this image. Um, the increased availability of grain that is coming from all of these new settlements uh, means uh, that uh, uh, there is sustained population growth. Uh, and uh, in effect, uh, slowly vegetable proteins, meat, and fish uh, all together uh, begin to create a healthier more balanced diet for people uh, and um, it, it, part of uh, the success too of uh, farming this period it is not simply the fact that uh, people were uh, were doing the same thing uh, in uh, in more fields but it's also fair to say uh, that technology was aiding in this process uh, so for instance uh, one thing we see uh, is that there's increased use of water mills to be able to ground grain. Um, why spend all of your time and effort using a mortar and pestle to uh, ground grain uh, when you can allow water to do the job for you? This is not a new technology, but uh, now it's being used uh, in a much larger space. Uh, we also see uh, a lot of thought about using animal power for plowing. Uh, and uh, although oxen continue to be used, um, we think that increasingly people are beginning to turn more and more to horses uh, to be able to help with this process of plowing. And uh, what people begin to discover during this period uh, that was that horses are, here's, here's obviously an image of horses, Horses were faster and they're more versatile. It was easier to turn them uh, when you're doing farming. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, horses even become uh, much better to use in as much as uh, uh, now uh, people begin to use better horseshoes and they adapt a better form of, uh, of yoke. Uh, again, this, uh, this thing that connects the horse with the plow. Uh, the previous form of yoke that had been popular since the Roman Empire 
was uh, that when it was used for horses was extremely poorly uh, designed. Uh, in fact, um, part of this yoke would actually go directly over the throat of a horse. And so uh, when it pulled harder, then it would be to <coughs> choke itself. Uh, so you can understand from the perspective of the horse why this was not an ideal situation. Uh, and uh, this new yoke that uh, Europeans begin to develop begins to place a lot more of uh, the force uh, on the shoulders of the horse rather than uh, on its throat. Uh, as uh, people made these changes, uh, they recognized uh, that um, one of the basic problems they were running into is that the kind of plow uh, that was being used, sometimes known as a scratch plow, uh, was one that essentially had been designed uh, primarily for Roman fields, um, fields around the Mediterranean, in, in which the soil, uh, for the most part, tended to be fairly light. Uh, but it fared poorly uh, in uh, uh, the, the further into the north uh, in Europe, uh, one you know, used this plow. And so the very heavy clay soils of northern Europe uh, would break the scratch plows. And so uh, Europeans now begin to design something that is called the heavy plow uh, that allows Europeans to much more easily cut through the damp, heavy clay soils of northern Europe. On top of uh, these, uh, these, other, uh, the, these other accomplishments, uh, another uh, area in which uh, mill technology is used is now in windmills. Windmills begin to appear all over the place as well. And again, just uh, for an obvious reason, the same reason as water mills. It's easier to, to have the power of wind grind your grain. On top of these other technologies, uh, Europeans increasingly will adapt what is known as the three-field system. Uh, previously, Europeans had had a two-field system uh, in which one of the two fields of Europeans would lie fallow, would not be planted on in any given season, uh, which really put a lot of uh, the productive land out of use uh, because you can't simply plant on a field every single, uh, every single season or, or exhaust the soil. Uh, but um, uh, that principle was still applied, but under the three field system, as the name would imply, only one field of three was allowed to lie fallow at any given season. As part of this system, we see Europeans beginning uh, to think a lot about um, a crop rotation. Uh, and um, in fact, incorporating as part of uh, their planting, uh, not just grain, but legumes, um, bee, uh, bee, peas, lentils, beans, um, all of these were, uh, first of all, good for one's nutrition, uh, but they were also good for putting nitrates in the soil, uh, which in turn would then help to refresh the soil and make it readier then uh, to grow grain in the future. All uh, of these trends are happy uh, ones when you consider that the amount of food that is being produced uh, meant that far more children are making it out of uh, infancy uh, than before. And uh, this is particularly good news uh, for uh, baby, uh, baby uh, young girls. Uh, and because uh, in times of resource scarcity, it does tend to be uh, girls who will die normally at a much higher rate uh, than male children because um, if people can only spare so much food, they tend to make sure uh, the male children are fed where uh, that's not always the case uh, with young girls. The great part about having a surplus of grain, more food uh, than you need strictly to survive, is that you can begin to do other things with that grain uh, in, a, in a time period in which grain is, in essence, money. Uh, then you could begin to trade that grain. Uh, and uh, we do see then the, uh, the agricultural underpinnings of a revival of commerce in this period. And uh, 
uh, all our signs show that there is really this vigorous exchange of goods uh, that begins to occur. Uh, and uh, in essence, uh, part of this is selling the agricultural surplus um, and uh, in cases uh, also purchasing what one could not produce oneself. Uh, and altogether, this meant that the amount of goods and money in circulation uh, begins to spike. Uh, and uh, we, uh, really, this uh, revival in commerce is especially uh, connected uh, with uh, those European countries around the Mediterranean. Uh, Venice, in this time period, emerges as a major trading center. Uh, and of course, we always th think about Venice uh, and its... Uh, its great access to the water and its uh, shipping culture, uh, but it was the agricultural land around Venice uh, that um, allowed, uh, really sparked uh, their ability to trade on the water. And uh, we see uh, the residents of Venice then taking grain, wine, and lumber and going into the east, uh, important cities like Constantinople, and then they would get some of the great luxury goods that could be purchased further in the East. Uh, for silk uh, is, is just one example. Then they could turn around and sell that silk to their Italian neighbors. Venice is not alone, I should say, though. Uh, other Italian cities at this time period, uh, think of Genoa and Pisa are good examples will uh, really do this exact same process and in the process emerge as great trading cities. Uh, and, uh, and in particular, all of these uh, new Italian cities uh, that are getting involved in, um, uh, in this trade to the east, of, uh, in part of their new uh, areas of trading are the, uh, uh, are the crusade uh, territories, the territories that Western Europeans have conquered uh, in the east. Uh, and uh, in effect, um, uh, they will go first to these crusading territories, will supply the people living there, uh, but then again, they will trade uh, for new goods that will flow into Europe. Uh, and uh, here's just a map of uh, the many kind of different trade links uh, that are beginning uh, to grow up in this period. Uh, so, for instance, uh, uh, again, Venice here and Pisa here. Um, other places, too, in Western Europe are becoming important for trade. Um, for instance, uh, modern-day Belgium uh, is becoming known for an area uh, that produces cloth. Um, and uh, what, what we see is, is quite uh, uh, interesting, though, is that uh, uh, the Belgians are known for producing cloth uh, that is very fine and richly dyed. Uh, but um, they are not able to produce uh, the wool. They didn't have the capacity. And so what they would do uh, was from England, they would import the wool. Uh, and then English merchants would take that wool, uh, take it to Belgium, uh, and then it would be finished there. And in the process, then they could carry back the finished cloth or other items uh, that were important at the time, like uh, French wine, uh, and then they could take it to England uh, and sell it. Uh, so we have a good example of cooperation between two places in improving the economy. Um, in the region, um, there's just some images of shearing sheep uh, in the Middle Ages, for instance. In uh, the region east of Paris, so in uh, modern-day France, uh, what we're also going to see uh, is uh, that some nobles will begin to promote international fairs uh, to, uh, to allow for trading. Uh, now, um, and uh, in, in some ways, uh, this is a very easy business uh, for nobles. All they really have to do is provide police to be able to keep order. Um, in some cases, uh, provide judges in case there were legal disputes, um, provide people like money changers. Uh, and um, what you really begin to see is that all sorts of uh, different merchants would descend on these uh, fairs. And uh, very often, uh, they uh, in some places they would have each day, they would have a different product that they would offer for sale. 
Uh, in some cases, they would just have groups of, of different products all together. Uh, and uh, what, what we see then is that um, um, the, the real benefit that we wonder why merchants would want uh, to, to do this. And that was simply because um, what they could do is really have a high density uh, of trading in one place and not have to, to travel quite as much. Uh, and uh, for, um, for the perspective of um, the traditional nobles, you shouldn't think that they liked merchants. They really thought that uh, uh, in some cases that this was really a disreputable way to earn money. But the nobles were no fools. Um, they received all sorts of taxes from these people uh, for allowing them to set up their fairs. Uh, so um, it, it was to their advantage uh, to allow the merchants to continue uh, to do what they were doing. Um, what we see in this period uh, is that, in fact, trading becomes so much of a way of life uh, that it really uh, the amount of coinage in circulation in uh, Western Europe was no longer uh, sufficient uh, for what they were doing. And often in the early Middle Ages, uh, people would simply use the same sort of uh, late Roman coins that had now been circulating for centuries. They really did not have enough of these anymore. Uh, and so uh, what you begin to see is a surge in new minting uh, in around Western Europe. Many of these coins would uh, be made of silver. Uh, and uh, in fact, um, some people, um, well, for one, one uh, the, uh, the crusading order known as the Templars, actually uh, begin to take part in a culture of exchange of money, uh, which becomes more of a profitable business at this point. Um, and really it hadn't existed as much in previous centuries. Uh, here's just some example of the kind of new silver coinages uh, that are being produced all over Europe. Another of the features uh, that really is inspired directly now by this growth of commerce is a stimulation in the growth of urban life, or you might say a, a rebirth in urban life. Now, what we had said was uh, toward the end of the Roman Empire, uh, many large cities would be reduced considerably in size, uh, and in some cases, uh, really, these cities just disappear entirely. Um, and uh, at least some of the cities that had simply uh, been uh, depopulated but not, had not completely uh, exist would just grow in size. So places that continued to maintain cathedrals and bishops uh, would be gradually resettled. And on top of that, um, new cities would be founded uh, for the first time. And it really was colonies of merchants who are helping to inspire uh, these new towns. Uh, here's just one French example. Here's a German example of some idea of what these medieval towns look like. What merchants would uh, tend to do uh, is they settled some place uh, initially that was uh, fortified. So, for instance, they would uh, often uh, pick up... Um, uh, a settlement near a castle or a monastery. Uh, and uh, in particular, usually uh, one that was located on a major trade route. And uh, the, uh, the impetus for this is clear. Uh, when merchants personally felt threatened, uh, they could simply run in the walls of a monastery or a castle to protect themselves. When... Um, when merchants begin to get more prosperous through all this trading, uh, it didn't make much sense to have this unsettled conditions. And so they actually begin uh, to take some of these small settlements and they begin to put up their own walls around themselves uh, and really to begin to create their own new cities. Now, you shouldn't think that uh, people really overwhelmingly begin to move to the city all at once. I mean, Western Europe is still a place that is overwhelmingly rural. However, because cities had uh, so much wealth, they exercised an outsized influence on the economy and, frankly, on political life as well at the same time. 
And uh, what we see in many cases are uh, uh, people who, uh, crafts workers, artisans, um, laborers, uh, people uh, who didn't want to live in, in the countryside anymore, would often uh, come into medieval cities and settle there. Uh, and uh, in, in some cases, uh, the people who would become merchants were people uh, who uh, had come from families in which people previously had been farmers, in some cases, knights. Um, and uh, uh, they decided that uh, their, their best economic shot would be to go and live in the city instead. Medieval people really begin to uh, gain the sense that there is a new freedom to be gained by moving to the city. Uh, and um, it, it, the freedom uh, really was specifically uh, from some of these noble lords who we said uh, were all over the place in the countryside. And uh, in some cases, in many cases, uh, these lords who had military power uh, were able to uh, uh, just simply strip peasants of a lot of their money through taxes, um, and uh, in many cases, they would force peasants to do all sorts of free labor for them. The, the need for new people in these cities uh, was so great, though, that the attitude of the cities was that any peasant, even if he had been uh, a vassal previously, who had moved to a, a city and whose lord had not managed to find him for a year and a day, would forever be free from the hold of that noble lord. The noble lord could not ask him anymore uh, for rent, uh, for uh, taxes, or for service. Uh, the new, uh, when you moved into a city, that's not to say that you didn't have to pay any money, but you would end up paying a limited amount of rent, uh, which uh, the amount was usually much fairer than people living in the countryside would have to pay. In many cases, uh, people in cities who belonged uh, to a similar job would begin to form what we refer to as guilds, which at least some people have seen as a, uh, the, the medieval equivalent to our modern unions. Uh, and uh, these guilds um, uh, would really... Um, would uh, first of all, they would uh, monopolize a certain uh, a certain area of business. Uh, so here, you know, the uh, blacksmiths, for instance, is just one example. Uh, so uh, they would uh, stand by anything produced by members of their guilds. Um, they would help to provide security for people in those guilds, make sure people paid their debts to guild members, um, and um, we also think that they play a huge social role. Uh, people in the same guilds would socialize with one another. Um, and as much as there was a security net, uh, the guilds would help to take care of, uh, uh, of your family if you died, help to pay for your funeral. Uh, and uh, we also see uh, that all of the guilds uh, have uh, some kind of patron saint, and uh, they would... Uh, sponsor with their own money religious festivals within any given city uh, to honor that saint. Um, we think that um, this um, uh, this new economic prosperity in Europe uh, begins to uh, create something that had not existed for quite some time in Europe, a middle class, a, a group uh, that did not really very easily fit uh, in, into the categories that he had learned about. Um, they're not exactly those who, who pray. They're not exactly those who work like peasants. Uh, they're not exactly those who fight like nobles. Uh, and um, just as with uh, merchants more generally, we do think many noble lords uh, were hostile to towns. Uh, they were suspicious at who these people were, uh, especially if they felt that they had more money than they should. Uh, but um, as we mentioned earlier, lords are so greedy uh, that they were, in essence, willing to take advantage of uh, towns and merchants and other guilds uh, so long as uh, they could tax them. Um, we also think that um, many traditional elements in the church uh, 
uh, tended to regard commercial activity with a great deal of suspicion as well. Um, avarice, greed, was, uh, was a, of course, a major sin. Uh, and um, especially in the early Middle Ages, uh, there were many people who were suspicious of even a, a prop, profit motive at all. Uh, to, you know, getting a bargain was seen as sometimes as a, an illicit thing. Um, it gradually, though, um, the church managed to accommodate itself uh, with um, this new commercial economy, at least to some degree. Uh, and uh, one of the very interesting things we see, for instance, is that um, the term usury uh, begins to um, uh, begins to take on a, a different meaning during this period. Um, and uh, usury itself uh, goes from lending at interest altogether, which was viewed uh, as something that was sinful, uh, to a uh, user begins to get referred to only lending at uh, at extensively high rates, uh, so gouging. Um, because um, really lending at interest uh, becomes something that uh, is viewed as morally suspect, uh, in uh, many cases, uh, Christians um, just because of social opprobrium, they did not want to do it themselves. And so, uh, in many cases, some people who would lend money uh, were part of the Jewish population, especially as uh, Jews were often forced out of other, uh, uh, other fields of work. This was one of the few that was open to them. Um, although, uh, uh, again, in, in, throughout this period, there were still, um, uh, numerically speaking, more Christian moneylenders than there were Jewish ones. Uh, but uh, the, the profession itself uh, still was something that uh, uh, was viewed with uh, uh, disapproval by many. Uh, and uh, we can see that, um, that there really is this kind of backlash against some people, uh, especially in the church. Uh, and uh, again, I love that this manuscript, Illumination in particular, uh, what you can see, in fact, is that uh, um, what's coming out of uh, th that fellow's backside uh, is excrement. So he's actually, uh, um, he, he's, uh, he's going to the bathroom and it's money, uh, which should give you some idea that uh, uh, some people viewed uh, money like excrement. Uh, and um, really, um, this, this backlash from some people within the church um, really uh, was wrapped up in this idea that, in fact, maybe the organized church was too tied up uh, with money, uh, with, uh, with uh, its institutional status. Maybe it accommodated itself too well with merchants uh, and this commercial culture. Maybe, in fact, it was better uh, to try and find a new path to God. Um, one uh, one possible avenue to do this are a group known as the Cartusians, who um, uh, really, in some ways, were a hermit-like uh, religious uh, group. Um, and uh, we, we really see that, um, uh, to some degree, uh, this uh, abandonment of some of uh, the group mentality or attitude uh, of, uh, of more traditional uh, orders like the Benedictines. Um, so, in effect, it, it, the fo its founder, uh, known as Bruno, uh, would end up actually living for a period of time as a hermit, uh, and eventually uh, he wanders into with a small group of followers into a barren mountain va valley, where he establishes the mother house of this order. Uh, what's very interesting to us about the Cartusians is that uh, the monks really spent almost their whole time in individual cells, uh, so not this communal ideal of some other orders. Uh, they would gather together uh, only to attend church services and then to eat uh, in a cafeteria on Sundays and feast days. Um, the Cartusians never ate meat. Uh, they fasted three days a week on bread and water. Uh, and... Um, to separate themselves from this culture of wealth, they would never accept any property outside of their main uh, headquarters. Uh, and uh, the Cartusians themselves um, were always very proud of the fact that uh, 
uh, they had such rigor in their order. They said that they, they were never reformed because they were never deformed. Uh, but um, the same things that they were proud of, of course, made them uh, a very difficult order to sell to many people. I mean, they really only applied to people or uh, appealed to people who were extremely enthusiastic. Um, another of the order that becomes important during this time uh, period is known as the Cistercians, and which really becomes uh, the most influential of the new orders at this time period. Uh, and um, we really think that in some ways uh, the Cistercians um, are, are, are in some ways like kind of reformed Benedictines. Um, they, um, they themselves uh, prized the rule of Benedict, uh, but they wanted to follow it with great strictness. Uh, and um, they, they had felt, in essence, that, um, uh, that in some ways the Benedictines uh, had become corrupted by money, uh, and uh, they were no longer following the rule of Benedict in, in the same sort of literal way that it was meant to be followed. Um, this order would um, uh, receive a particular inspiration uh, from a man known, uh, shown here, known as Bernard of Clairvaux. Uh, and uh, Bernard himself was a really a fascinating medieval figure. Um, he himself uh, um, had also, it was a mystic, um, really, in some cases, uh, uh, someone who believed uh, that uh, his views were completely right. Uh, and he really um, combats very strongly any of those who attempt to disagree with him. Uh, and uh, some of those groups that he goes after, for instance, are any intellectuals for, who, for him, um, have somewhere along the way forgotten true Christian virtues. Uh, and um, because um, of his, uh, his role in the success of the Cistercians and his personal reputation for holiness, uh, we think that Bernard uh, is constantly intervening in the public affairs of his own age. Uh, he becomes an advisor, personal advisor to the French king. He, uh, he helps in the foundation of the Knights Templar. He preaches the Second Crusade. Uh, and um, we think that altogether, uh, he uh, really ends up becoming a, an advertisement for uh, the Cistercians. I mean, uh, Really, um, they rapidly expand because of his high profile. The Cistercians themselves um, really uh, live uh, what they feel is a strict Benedictine life. They have uh, simple garments. They uh, eat a meager diet. Um, they insisted that their churches and buildings be simple and undecorated. Uh, and uh, unlike some of the other Benedictines that they felt spent so much time in public worship and liturgy, uh, they begin to actually uh, cut down some of that worship to allow more time for private prayer uh, for, and uh, uh, also for work, um, including agricultural work. Uh, and um, we see that um, the, uh, the Cistercian monks uh, were uh, really often chose properties that were on uninhabited lands. Uh, and they went to work them themselves. And uh, they would actually refuse gifts that uh, were attached to peasant labor. Uh, they felt that they were supposed to be the ones who were doing that labor. Uh, and uh, it is something of an irony that um, the Cistercians were so good at doing agriculture um, especially on territory that was often viewed by others as wasteland, uh, that um, they didn't remain poor for very long, that in fact uh, the fruits of their own labor really meant uh, that um, they would actually become quite rich. We also see uh, hand in hand uh, with this sort of new sort of um, culture in which material, uh, material levels are prospering, a growth in cathedral schools, uh, these new centers of learning that really begin to take learning uh, outside of monasteries. 
Now, uh, we've said more than once in this class that, uh, um, that monasteries had been extremely important for the intellectual life of Western Europe. And that without monasteries, uh, many of the great works of the past would never have been preserved. And all of that continued to be true. With that being said, um, many people think that monasteries were fundamentally conservative organizations. Uh, and um, they were far more interested in preserving knowledge than they were in advancing it. Uh, and um, really, monks for the most part, tended to be far less interested in this kind of new world that we've been discussing of uh, new uh, new commercial life, uh, new trade, new towns. Uh, and um, in, in fact, now people would begin instead uh, to look to cathedral schools for that same thing. Uh, and uh, well, what we really see in this period is that in, in many of these cities, all of which have cathedrals, um, the cathedral themselves begins to start out as a, uh, a center of learning and teaching. Uh, and uh, in many cases, um, we think that uh, merchants uh, begin to become, uh, become interested in finding new outlets for their own children uh, to be able to learn, to have a liberal arts education. Uh, with the idea that uh, that would better help them advance their careers, it would give them more possibilities in the future. One of the particular places, uh, really the center in Western Europe uh, of this new uh, culture of cathedral schools uh, is Paris, uh, and uh, had the most famous uh, guild of masters here. Uh, and uh, I, I should say uh, that um, uh, in cathedral schools, initially, they do actually initially start out being taught directly in the cathedral, and then just gradually, then uh, they begin to uh, rent out rooms around cathedrals uh, to do this kind of learning. Uh, and eventually, these are simply going to be referred to as universities. Um, and uh, we see in Paris uh, the the movement of all of these students. Uh, around uh, all around the cathedral, and uh, in fact, um, Paris is so good at uh, producing um, different uh, intellectuals that a splinter group uh, from Paris will eventually found Oxford, and then yet a and a splinter group from the uh, professor in Oxford will then found its own uh, university in Cambridge, and other centers of learning uh, in Western Europe are growing up at the same time. Uh, for instance, the Italian city of Bologna is uh, going to become known for uh, its mastery of legal studies, uh, so yet another important field. Uh, now, as I had mentioned, um, there was nothing like a modern-day campus in these medieval universities. Um, in effect, um, what we really uh, begin to see is that uh, what uh, individual professors or masters, as they referred to them, uh, would do is go out and rent space, rent rooms, uh, to be able to hold their lessons. And then they would also have to collect fees. Um, I, I can only thank God that I do not have to do this. Uh, we, can, we know that um, the collection of fees was, as you may well imagine, uh, one of the great headaches of teachers. And in some cases, um, clever students would not show up on the day in which their uh, their fees were due to try to dodge the professor for as long as possible. Uh, in uh, these medieval classrooms, the language that was used, the closest thing to a universal language was Latin. And then really, um, given just how disunified uh, some of the common vernacular languages were, I mean, there really was virtually no option at the time uh, if they wanted to, uh, to be able to communicate. Uh, really, Latin was the only one that had enough of these intellectual uh, terms to be able to use. Most students were poor and could never have afforded um, textbooks. Uh, what ends up happening, for the most part, uh, is that uh, the professor would read a paragraph uh, for the day, 
uh, and then students would copy out uh, that particular passage on a wax tablet like the one you see here. Um, and uh, uh, the wax tablet, I should say, uh, is actually quite a handy uh, piece of technology. Um, the, the one problem with this is that um, uh, students would generally only have one of these. Uh, so um, students would, at the end of the day, you could memorize whatever you chose uh, based upon those notes, and then you could heat it up the wax and smear it over and then use it again. Um, so after the uh, the professor would read out uh, the uh, a passage for the day, uh, he, he would go uh, and then um, explain or elucidate what the meaning of the text was. Uh, and uh, in this, uh, for lectures, um, teachers uh, by law require to begin and end on time, or uh, they could actually receive fines. Another part I could do with that of medieval education. Uh, we also know that if uh, professors uh, were supposed to speak clearly, as clearly as possible, uh, and or else uh, they could be fined, um, they had to uh, speak reverently about certain topics regarding religion, uh, and uh, they had to keep to the subject matter in question. And again, uh, all of these um, could incur fines if they ignored them. Um, and uh, so students did certainly, uh, although they had to uh, pay money, uh, they certainly uh, retained a lot of power in the system. Um, it's fair to say, too, in these universities um, that uh, uh, there is the development for the first time of a real student uh, culture. Uh, here, for instance, is a, uh, this is a, a funny little picture on the side of a manuscript that shows one person pouring wine uh, down a student's mouth. Uh, and uh, we really see uh, in uh, around uh, many of these universities uh, all sorts of uh, bars beginning to grow up. We know that uh, students are known for uh, the drinking of quite a lot of wine at the time. Uh, we know, for instance, uh, that um, that they would sing all sorts of songs. Uh, they would compose uh, their own verses, usually that are, are, are funny or witty. Uh, and uh, in some cases, by the way, they even created parodies of things that uh, we might consider uh, to be very sacred. Uh, so, for instance, there are actually parodies uh, of portions of uh, the liturgy uh, that uh, here uh, were uh, really just used for fun. So these sort of um, um, these sort of perversions uh, of uh, the actual liturgical text were used just uh, for for laughs. On top of all of these other developments, um, one of the things that is interesting about this new commercial system uh, is that it revealed to Europeans the need for more law, or uh, really new law. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned to you in the early Middle Ages, uh, there really was a fairly limited legal system. Uh, that uh, in many cases, um, what you got in terms of a legal system was whatever your local lord offered. Uh, that you know the, your local lord uh, would decide um, on on particular cases, and uh, and uh, if it, if anything had to do with the interests of the lord, of course, you may not never be able to get justice. Um, but especially um, the, the legal system uh, such as it existed uh, really didn't hold any answers to the many and many sort of questions uh, that were involved uh, with trade at the level now that have been created uh, and all sorts of lawsuits begin to fly uh, at this time um, about um, you know who owed whom what. Uh, and um, it is very unclear how to settle any of these things. This is why many intellectuals begin uh, to hail back to an earlier system of law that actually did um, it address many of the same commercial uh, problems in the past, and that is, of course, the Roman law. Uh, and uh, we really see uh, from right around the year 1100 onward, uh, there is this enthusiasm for the study of classical Roman law. Uh, and uh, 
in, in fact, the, um, uh, the compendium of Roman law uh, that had been created during the 6th century Byzantine uh, emperor's time, uh, Justinian's time, uh, was now rediscovered by Western Europeans. Uh, and then it was spread very widely, uh, and it was studied by professors, who then would draw upon uh, many of these laws to be able to hammer out new legal codes in Europe. And uh, just by looking at uh, Roman law, we can understand what these thinkers were reacting to. Um, this was a complex body of sophisticated law uh, that was organized according to rational principles. Um, it gave one an idea, uh, again, sometimes these very complex uh, legal cases, how to resolve them appropriately. Um, and uh, we also see, too, that um, um, there wasn't just this sort of a, a wholesale adoption of every single thing uh, that Roman law had. And uh, although um, Western Europeans, on the whole, would have agreed to the principle that the best law is old law, um, they also recognized uh, that um, you had to take this uh, old Roman law and adapt it to make it usable to new circumstances. And so um, throughout Europe, uh, you see um, people interacting with the Roman law in, in slightly different ways and uh, using some of its language or some of its principles, but uh, to create, in some cases, very different laws. Uh, some people would say, as one offshoot of this process, uh, Europeans begin to reinstitute the idea of a state, uh, that um, a government could be a public authority uh, that was endowed with the powers of legislation, that um, law was not private law that just issued forth from powerful lords, uh, but instead uh, it was something that was much higher, more sweeping. Uh, and uh, you should not think of, um, again, this new sort of um, excitement with law as being something that was merely confined to a secular space. Uh, in fact, um, in, in uh, the church, canon law uh, is also going to grow up, interacting with the exactly same Roman laws, um, and uh, used primarily, in the case of the church, then, uh, to um, law was used as, as a means to preserve the rights of the church, uh, to uh, enforce the role of the pope uh, as both a legislator and a judge. Uh, and... Uh, in fact, um, what we really see is that, um, uh, in essence, as time goes on, part of the job description of Pope uh, begins to become someone uh, that uh, uh, who knew canon law well enough to use it. Uh, and so, uh, for, for many issues having to do with ecclesiastical law, so think about for things having to do uh, with marriage, um, or in many cases of things having to do uh, with the rights of uh, the church in individual cities. Uh, we really see the papacy begins to become the highest court of appeal from around Europe. And so the legal culture uh, has a very practical outgrowth in the, the, uh, uh, the emergence of all sorts of different courts uh, in Rome. Uh, and what we'll see as we go on to uh, this idea of a state uh, will also be resonant uh, as we begin to see much stronger monarchies uh, in places uh, like uh, France and England. So there, there are going to be other uh, practical implications uh, for uh, this, uh, this new interaction with Roman law uh, throughout Western Europe. All right. Thank you for your attention. Bye-bye.